I would like to welcome now our speaker of today. Before I do this, I would like to uh, mention the uh, occasion of this uh, for those uh, who, 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 are, uh, who do not participate in the workshop or the conference, which is the, the, uh, the occasion. We have a workshop right now at the university uh, at the occasion of 50 years of Bell's theorem. Uh, 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 the the uh, uh, Irish famous Irish physicist John Bell, who 50 years ago discovered that some some I would still say rather reasonable assumptions about how the world should behave are actually in conflict with with uh, with quantum uh, uh, physics. And uh, my my co-organizer. Uh, Professor Bertelmann is here in the first row, and I would also like to uh, uh, welcome Mary Bell, uh, the widow of, of John Bell, that she is, is here at the Academy and joined us for this little conference. Now, one of the persons who contributed significantly to the experiments uh, concerning Bell's theorem is our speaker of today, uh, Professor Alain SP, whom I would like to welcome very much here, and I might introduce him a little bit, I cannot read it all, otherwise you don't have much time to, to for your talk anymore. <laughs> Professor Aspe was uh, born in the in the in the south of France, and when you talk to him, he is you, 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 probably you cannot be more French than 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 Alain. <laughs> this is really <laughs> France that it is. Was born in the south of France, and he got his education at the Ecole Normale de Cachan and at the Université. Dorsey, and his uh, PhD thesis became very famous. It's called Three Experimental, Experimental Tests of Bell's Inequalities with Entangled Photons. Uh, and this is what this conference is also all, all about. Uh, uh, his career, maybe I mentioned one or two points. He was scientist at the Collège de France uh, for seven years. In the, in the group uh, of the chair of atomic physics, which um, uh, is held by Claude Cohen Tanucci. And at present, uh, he is uh, associated with the uh, Institut Optique, with the Ecole Polytechnique, uh, and uh, with uh, CNRS. Uh, he has had many awards. This is again too long to, to read it. I would mention a few. One is the CNRS gold medal. Another one is the Wolf Prize in Physics, which he shared with two other people in this room. Uh, one person I would, I would uh, like to uh, uh, mention is John Clauser, who sits back there in the, in, in the four, fifth or sixth uh, row. Uh, then uh, he also won the Einstein medal, he won two Niels Bohr gold medals. I did not know that there exist two. Maybe there exist even more. We can keep, keep collecting. And he, he recently won the Balzan Prize. I should also mention that he is a member of a, a number of academies, certainly the Académie des Sciences in, in Paris, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and also, and this is what we are very happy and proud about, he is also a member of this academy, of the Austrian Academy uh, uh, of Sciences. So welcome home to your own academy, and, and I'm very pleased that you will be giving the lecture today. I should mention that he gave a number of, uh, of distinguished lectures, uh, uh, beginning with the Loeb lecture uh, at uh, lectures at, at Harvard University. He has honorary doctorates of five universities. Maybe it's no more already, I don't know, but it will be it will be uh, growing and so on and so on. Uh, uh, but without further ado, I think uh, we should start with the presentation. And please, Alain, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anton. Thank you. Is the microphone? Yes. Okay. Of course, everybody understood that the third laureate of the Wolf Prize is the president of the Academy of Science. <laughs> well, it's a real pleasure and a great honor to be here for this public lecture 
first because we are in a famous place, but also because it is on the occasion of this uh, wonderful conference that was uh, established, and in particular by uh, Reinhold uh, Bertelmann, a beautiful uh, conference about 50 years of uh, Bell's theorem about quantum mechanics, and of course I'm impressed to talk in front of Marie Bell and in front of many people who have contributed so much to this uh, subject. Uh, it's also a pleasure to say that uh, my talk will be not only about conceptual discussion, but uh, we probably live a, a new quantum revolution, including for technology, the technology of quantum information, and Austria is certainly one of the countries uh, which has a very strong uh, effort for this research on quantum information from basic ideas to application. And for instance, there is this fantastic institute for quantum optics and quantum information, which belongs, if I understand well, to the Academy of Science, which has a part in Innsbruck, a part here, and uh, I'm really impressed by the achievements uh, in, the, in this country, so it's even more a pleasure. So let us start with a talk. The talk is, at the end, we have information, quantum information, but at the beginning, we had a big debate between Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr, and I will just, as a kind of summary, uh, did you, uh, give you a, a few words about how quantum information did emerge, and then we will go into the details of the starting point and a little bit about what's happening now. And when the talk will go on, you will know who are all the gentlemen who are here. Of course, the hero of today is John Bell, who is here. Okay, let's start. How did it emerge? Well, before saying what is the second quantum revolution, I need to remind you what is the first quantum revolution. The first quantum revolution took place in the first three decades of the 20th century, and it was based on a strange quantum property, which is wave-particle duality for a single particle. When you have a single particle, you have to describe it not only as a particle, but also as a wave. And strange as it is, uh, it allowed physicists to make fantastic progress. For instance, it was a really new understanding of the world. It allowed physicists to understand standard properties of matter, mechanical, electrical, optical. Maybe for people, for, for the general audience who is here, they don't realize that before the invention or the discovery, I don't know how to say, of quantum mechanics, it was not even possible to understand why matter is stable. At the end of the 19th century, uh, people knew that matter was made of positive and negative electric charges. And it's well known that positive and, electric, uh, uh, positive and negative electric charges attract each other. So matter should collapse. And the reason why it does not collapse, there is no reason until the moment when you know quantum mechanics. Classical physics cannot explain why matter does not collapse on it. So you know, properties like the stability of matter, or more generally mechanical properties, electrical properties, optical properties of matter were fully understood thanks to quantum mechanics. Exotic properties of things like superfluidity, supraconductivity, here is some piece of metal floating, okay, boson chain condensation. But quantum mechanics is not only about, and the first quantum revolution, is not only about understanding the world, it's also unbelievable revolutionary application inventions. Laser, transistor, integrated circuits, this was not invented by a guy in a garage in California. It was really invented by the best physicist of the mid-20th century, trying to understand in detail how matter allow electric currents to propagate in certain materials, semiconductors, etc., etc. And of course, you realize that the invention of laser, transistor, invented circuit, 
was absolutely crucial to the development of what we call today information and communication society, which probably has changed the society as much as the invention of the heat engine in previous century did change the society. So it's not a small impact. This was about the first quantum revolution. We can say that conceptually it was achieved by 25, maybe 30. Okay. Now, what about the new quantum revolution? I think fair to say that it started in 1935 when Einstein, with two collaborators, Podolsky and Rosen, wrote a famous paper, Can Quantum Mechanical Description, the so-called EPR for Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen paper, about the completeness of the description by quantum mechanics. He was challenging the current, uh, accept, uh, the current interpretation of quantum mechanics at that time, which was developed by Niels Bohr and his collaborators. And Niels Bohr disagreed with Einstein. And there was a very important man who also put his grain of salt in the discussion, Erwin Schrödinger. I think it's appropriate to cite him here, but I cite him everywhere. And, uh, Evelyn Schrödinger also understood as early as 1935 that there was something really very interesting in what EPR has discovered. It's a new quantum feature entanglement. And this gave a hot debate between giants about interpretation. 30 years later, in 64, so now we celebrate 50 years later, uh, John Bell, find that it was not only a debate about interpretation. John Bell found that there were practical consequences of the fact that either Einstein or Niels Bohr would be right in this debate. And he showed that quantum mechanics, as developed by Niels Bohr and his collaborator, could not be reconciled with Einstein's worldviews. And then the next step to come to the step of quantum information is Two decades later, a great, really great physicist of the 20th century, of the second half of the 20th century, Richard Feynman, realized that entanglement is really as surprising as we should know from the debate of Einstein, Bohr, John Bell, etc. And Feynman made the next step. He said, if it is so extraordinary, probably we can use it from something and he invented the concept of quantum information. So let us go into that more in details. Let us start with the Einstein-Bohr debate, and we will go to Bell's inequalities, and all this is about entanglement. Probably many of you, but probably not all of you, know that the situation of Einstein regarding quantum mechanics is quite strange. Einstein can be legitimately considered one of the main founding fathers of quantum mechanics. His paper is of 1905, uh, saying that light, which we think is a wave, should also be considered as made of grains of light, Licht quantum, later named photon. This paper was an absolute revolution and is one of the main moments for the development of quantum mechanics. And not everybody knows that he got the Nobel Prize in 1922, not for relativity, not for general relativity, not for one of these many achievements that he made, but for this hypothesis then demonstrated by the experiment of Millikan that yes, we have to consider that light is made of least quanta, of quanta. But then, in the 20s, while quantum mechanics, the first quantum revolution, was being developed by Niels Bohr and people around him, and also by Schrödinger, and also by Dirac, Einstein was more and more dissatisfied by the interpretation that Niels Bohr and colleagues were giving of this strange new mechanism. In other words, the situation was kind of surprising. They were developing a mathematical formalism which was working very well, but the question was, how should we understand the world knowing that the world follows this formalism? This is a matter of interpretation. And 
the Copenhagen school, people around Niels Bohr, had a certain type of interpretation, and Einstein was totally dissatisfied with it. And so he began to find, to elaborate discussion, and he discussed many things. For instance, Heisenberg inequality. He did not like Heisenberg inequality, but each time he was coming with a good argument against Heisenberg inequality, then Bohr would reply and reply in such a way that Einstein would admit that Bohr was right. But then in 1935, he found an argument, the famous EPR argument, and this argument, I think, was so strong that at this point, we cannot say that the reply of Bohr was more satisfactorily than the argument of EPR. So it was really a situation where the debate was not settled, and this objection was underestimated for a long time, basically 30 years, until Bell did his main discovery in 1964. So let us try to understand what was the point that Einstein and his colleagues were trying to make in the 1935 paper. It turns out that, I'm going to show you a small experiment in uh, two minutes. It turns out that in most of the cases, quantum mechanics does not make definite predictions about an experiment, but it makes only probabilistic prediction. In other words, quantum mechanics tells you if you, take, if you send a photon on a, an apparatus here, you may find the photon here, or you may find the photon there, and what quantum mechanics allows you to calculate is in 30% of the cases you are going to find it here, in 70% of the cases you are going to find there. And it's quite surprising. A fundamental theory, shouldn't a fundamental theory tell you if I prepare carefully things, then I am sure that it will go here or that it will go there. So Einstein was not happy with the idea that uh, a theory uh, give only statistical prediction. And so he thought that maybe quantum mechanics was a kind of statistical uh, theory. Here it's again appropriate to mention another great Austrian physicist, Boltzmann. Boltzmann describes statistically the distribution of the velocities of the molecules flying here in, this, uh, in the atmosphere, in that room. But nobody doubts that actually the molecules do have a velocity, collide against each other, and fly. It's just a convenience to describe statistically, because it would be impossible to describe in details the billions and billions of molecules flying here. But, so we use the probabilistic description as a convenient tool, but we have no doubt that there is an underlying description where we could, in principle, describe the motion of any single molecule. Similarly, Einstein said, couldn't we imagine that quantum mechanics is a kind of statistical physics and that there is an underlying world and that the goal of physics is to discover this underlying world? And with the reasoning of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, he thought he had found an argument, a uh, proof that you need to introduce this underlying world, that is to say, to complete quantum mechanics. So let us see what is an Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen experiment, not in the historical version, but in the version which has allowed uh, many of us to do experiments to test these ideas. So this is how it works. Here we have a source which emits pairs of photons. So when a pair is emitted, you have a photon going to the left. Let's say it's a red photon and a photon going to the right. It's a blue photon, so they don't have the same color. And then what we are going to do here is a measurement of polarization. What does it mean? I apologize for my colleagues who are here, but this is a public conference, so I have to explain what it means. You can think of light as a vibration perpendicular to the propagation. And this vibration, of course, can be like that, or like that, or like that. And if you want to measure the direction of this polarization, you have an apparatus here, which is a polarizer, which is such that if it vibrates uh, vertically, it will go into this channel. If it vibrates horizontally, 
it will go in this channel. Actually, when I say vertically or horizontally, it's because I suppose that the polarizer is oriented like that. Now, if I turn my polarizer, if I vibrate like that, it will go in channel plus one, and if it vibrates perpendicular, it will go in, in channel minus, minus one. So here, they are prepared for me, and I have to thank them, a small experiment, which may work, but I better switch off the image. No. Sorry for that. Okay. So now there is a laser beam, which is polarized, okay, and uh, it goes through a polarizer, and here, obviously, it goes into one output channel of the polarizer, which means that it is polarized along that direction. But if now I turn the polarization of the beam, then it will go into the other channel. So now I say that it's polarized along minus one. So if I have a, a beam like that, and that now I put the polarization at an angle, so the polarization is at an angle from the axis of the polarizer, then you see that there is a fraction of the light going on one side and a fraction of the light going on the other side. So far, so good. But suppose now, so let's say 70% goes on the right, okay, it's probably about that, okay? 70% goes on the right, 30% goes on the left. But let's suppose that rather than having a beam like that with billions and billions of photons, let's suppose I have a single photon. Well, the single photon is not going to be split into 70% of a photon on one side and 30% of the photon on the other side. The photon will go either on one side or on the other side. But if we repeat the experiment many times, then 70% of the time it will go on one side and 30% of the time it will go on the other time. This is what happens when you say, or this is the meaning of what we say when we say that quantum mechanics makes a statistical prediction. So let us come again to this scheme of einstein polarsky rosen I send this, this photon here, and I measure its polarization along the axis A, and sometimes I find plus one, sometimes I find minus one, which allows me, by repeating the experiment many times and looking at statistics, to find what are the single probabilities. In the case I show, it would have been 70%, 30%. I do the same thing for the other photon, which is here, and I can measure the probability of single detection. But there is something which is much more interesting and which is the core of what I am going to present. I can also measure joint probabilities. What does it mean? It means I send a pair and I look if I have plus plus or plus minus or minus plus or minus minus. And when I repeat many times this experiment with many different pairs, at the end, I can make statistics and say in this fraction of cases, uh, I add plus plus. In another fraction of cases, I add minus minus. Now, you may not have completely understood what is the meaning of A and B. A and B are just the direction of the polarizer. So AB is nothing else than the angle between the two polarizers, okay? And we will see that this depends on the angle. Indeed, what Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen discovered is that quantum mechanics allows one to write a state for light, for the polarization of the two photons, which writes like that. At this point, I would not like to have really general public going out because they are frightened by equation. So I just would like to tell you something. If you go to a concert, some of you may know how to read music, but many of us go to concert, do not know how to read music, and anyway, we listen to the concert and we enjoy it. So don't be afraid by the equation. Some people in the room can read the equation. Other people in the room cannot read the equation, but they can listen to me. I'm not going to sing, but I'm going to explain the equation with words. So don't be frightened. And I can hear, even tell you what is strange and beautiful in this equation. This strange notation here that I would have emitted a pair of photons with polarization vertical like that. So XX means I have a pair of photons vibrating like that. YY means 
a pair of photons vibrating like that and propagating. What Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen discovered is that quantum mechanics allows us to consider such a state in which we have a pair of photons which is both vibrating like this and vibrating like that. This is far from trivial. It's not, don't think that it is something like vibrating at 45 degrees. No, no, it's really both vibrating like this and vibrating like that. And it's as surprising as the famous Schrödinger cat, which is both dead and alive. Having a pair of photons vibrating like this and like that at the same time is as surprising as a Schrödinger cat being dead and alive simultaneously. So, Einstein, Polosky, and Rosen say, ho ho, the mathematics of quantum mechanics allow us to consider it. Now, if we have that, the standard mathematics of quantum mechanics allows us to calculate the probability to get plus one, minus one, p plus plus, p plus minus. When I calculate the single probability, I find same probability to go here and there. In other words, when the photon arrives here, it has the same probability of 50% of going here and 50% of going there. Same on the other side, 50% to go there, 50% to go there. So it looks totally random. I throw a coin here, it's head of tail. I throw a coin here, same probability. The interesting thing is the following. The calculation, based again of this state, standard calculation, allows me to calculate p plus plus as a function of the angle. You have cosine square, sine square, etc. A very interesting case is a case where the angle is zero. In other words, I put the two polarizers along the same direction. If I do that, quantum mechanics tells me that the joint probability is also 50%. So you are going to tell me, OK, 50%. What is special about 50%? Well, this means total correlation. And the reason is the following. Think of this photon. Arriving here, 50% chance to go here. Now think of the pair of photons. 50% chance to get the first one here and the second one here. It means that the conditional probability to find the second photon in this channel if the first photon goes to this channel, this conditional probability is 100%. It's absolute certainty. In other words, this formula tells me that two photons travel to the polarizer. This photon has 50% chance, chance to go here. This one also at 50% chances to go here. But if first photon goes in plus one, then the second photon goes into plus one. And if the first photon had decided to go in minus one, then the second photon would have decided to go in minus one. If you are not fully convinced, look at the second formula. The probability to get plus one and minus one is exactly zero. So what we have is either plus plus or minus minus, but never plus minus, never minus plus. This is called a total correlation. Strong correlation in physics demand to be understood, okay? And before trying to understand it, I have just to tell you, and you don't have to look into the details, this transparency that my colleagues can understand easily, is just to tell you that in the general case, when the two polarizers are not exactly parallel or perpendicular, we also know how to define mathematically what is the coefficient of correlation. We can say, is it strong or not strong? And we have a formula for it, and this is a formula of the coefficient of correlation as predicted for quantum mechanics for any angle between the polarizer. And if the angle is zero, we find a coefficient of correlation of one, which means total correlation. Okay. Let us go again to, we have a correlation, we demand to understand correlation. I think, at the end of the day, that the work, the job of a physicist is to understand correlation. You push on a button here, something happens there, there is a correlation. And you want to understand how come that when I push a button here, a light switch on here, okay? And the role of physics is to understand how correlation happen in the world. So how can we understand this strong correlation predicted between what happens here and what happens there? 
Can we derive an image from the calculation that led us to this formula? Unfortunately, if you take here again, just listen to the words, but my colleagues can understand what I mean. If you want to make an image from the easiest way to do the calculation, then you have a big problem. This calculation happens in an abstract space, which is fine. There is nothing wrong in doing a calculation in an abstract mathematical space. But if you insist on understanding how it works in the real world, it's very difficult to make an image. And uh, as a famous theorist in quantum optics once wrote, quantum phenomena do not occur in a Hilbert space. They occur in a laboratory. So I insist on making images in making a clear, understandable explanation, image, in our world, in the world where we live, not an abstract mathematical space. And for that, I can do a calculation which is a little more involved, but which is absolutely correct. I mean, it's a totally standard calculation in standard quantum mechanics, and this is the way it works. You suppose that the first polarizer it's a little closer to the source than the other one. So we are going to do first measurement here. And then we know that we have 50% chance to find plus one or 50% chance to find minus one. Result plus one would correspond to polarization X, while result minus one would correspond to polarization Y perpendicular to the screen. Now, how should I proceed to continue? I go to my textbook on quantum mechanics, and they tell me that just after the measurement happens, then I must project the initial state vector onto these big words, eigenspace associated to the result. This is a famous collapse of the state wave vector, and the result is very interesting, it's here. If I find the result plus one associated to polarization X, then just after the measurement, the two photons are described by this state vector. And this one is very interesting, because now it's no longer Schrodinger cut, which is a strange superposition of something. Now it's just XX, which means that the first photon was found with polarization X, but the second one also has a well-defined polarization X. So I am not surprised if now I measure this one with this polarizer, I find plus one, because it is X. But if the measurement on the first polarizer gives me minus one. It means polarization Y perpendicular to the screen. And then the other one becomes Y also, and now it will go in minus one. And with this, I have an explanation for the correlation. And the reasoning can be easily extended. So this, when I measure on the second photon, well, this is what I have already explained you. And you can generalize the reasoning to the case where the second polarizer is turned, we have what is called the Malus law, and at the end of the day, with this, we get the same result as calculated by the efficient but difficult to interpret calculation, but now we have a picture in our ordinary space. So we have a picture in our ordinary space, so we should be happy, but there is a catch, there is a problem, and the problem is the following. The measurement on the first photon seems to influence instantaneously at a distance the state of the second photon. I told you, if I find this, then the other one becomes X. But if I find minus one, the other one becomes Y. Of course, such an instantaneous action of a distance was not acceptable by Einstein. Remember that Einstein invented relativity, and the basic postulate in relativity is that nothing can go faster than light. And here we are talking of an instantaneous influence. Sounds strange, right? So what can we do with that? Well, there is a more reasonable image, as it was suggested by the reasoning of Einstein, Polosky, and Rosen, is that we could complete quantum mechanics in the following way. There is a very natural way for understanding correlation between separated measurement at a distance, and to convince you that there is a simple image, we are going to make a, a rapid experiment. I ask everybody to watch carefully on the screen, especially when I will count one, two, three. Okay, look in the middle of the screen. One, two, three. Now. If I ask the president of the Academy of Science, what did you observe? 
a tree. What did you observe on the screen? You observe a green point moving on the screen, right? Now, I'm pretty sure if I ask a distinguished theoretician, mathematician who is sitting on the front row, he's not a good experimentalist, but I am sure he has observed carefully anyway. What did you observe? A green light moving. This is extraordinary. There is a full correlation between what has been observed on this side and what has been observed on that side. <laughs> it's an unbelievable correlation. Is it unbelievable? Not at all. I can make a very simple model. Here, I push on the button. I activate a laser. The laser beam propagates to the screen. Then there is scattering, propagates to the eye. What I mean is that when I have correlation, between distant observations is not a big mystery. It means that there is a common cause in the pact. The common cause is the fact that my, my uh, finger pushes on the button, and then it explains the correlation between what people on that side and people on the other side have observed. Okay? So the idea is very simple. When the two photons are emitted, they have a common property. For instance, we could think that both vibrate like that. And so, of course, if both vibrate like that, and we put the polarizer in the right position, both are going to go out, to, to go up, okay? But then maybe for the next pair of photons, both are going to vibrate like that. And so, they propagate, and they will go down. And so, it's a simple explanation. Of course, you, you can refine it, and you introduce a supplementary parameter, which tells you if the photon vibrates like this, or like that, or like that, okay? And it's a simple explanation to understand the uh, correlation. If you are not convinced that it is a serious explanation, you should remember that before that we knew how to do all these analyses of the genes of DNA, medical doctors concluded by observing twin brother and seeing that either the twin brother develop a certain disease or that the twin brother do not develop this disease, they concluded that the disease was due to a genetic cause and that the fact that the two brothers develop the disease is due to the fact that they have the same set of chromosomes. Here, we are invoking exactly the same kind of idea. Because we observe correlation on photon nu one and photon nu 2 we say the two photons are the same between, quote, chromosome. And this we call lambda. It's a mathematical quantity. So it looks a very convincing image, but Bohr disagrees fully. Why? Because Bohr had the deep intuition that if you complete quantum mechanics, if you introduce something supplementary in quantum mechanics, the whole formalism of the whole theory will fall apart. And uh, indeed, in adding, a lambda here, we complete quantum mechanics because remember that in quantum mechanics, all the pairs of photons are described by the same state vector, this mathematical object which is here. But when I add this supplementary idea, although all are described by the same state vector, some, in addition, will vibrate like that, other will vibrate like that, etc., etc. So both disagreed. So what happened then? Nothing. Nothing happened except that Bohr and Einstein continued to argue on that until the end of their life. There are plenty of witnesses that they never stopped arguing about this and no one could convince the other one. But this debate between Bohr and Einstein did not draw any attention from a majority of physicists. Why? We should not say because they were just stubborn and did not want to listen. There were good reasons. First, as I was explaining a few minutes ago, quantum mechanics was accumulating success, okay? Could, again, explain many properties of, light, of nature, etc., etc. But I think another very important fact that should not be underestimated is the following. Bohr and Einstein did not disagree on the way to use the mathematics of quantum mechanics. They only disagreed on the interpretation. So, look, you are a young physicist in the, let's say, 1940. You know that quantum mechanics works beautifully. There are, of course, these two giants arguing about interpretation, but they don't argue about the way to use it. So you use it, you are safe, and you do it, and you don't care. You say, okay, when I am old and when I retire, then it will be time to think about interpretation, okay? 
And so we can understand this, in my opinion, is really a very important reason. It was only a disagreement about interpretation. The situation totally changed with the big discovery of John Bell in 1964. Unfortunately, it was after the death of both Bohr and Einstein, so we cannot know what would have been the reaction of these giants, but that's, a, that's the way things evolve. So Bell discovered that if you take seriously the idea that the correlation can be understood by adding some parameter, lambda, to the theory, then whatever is the way you work out this supplementary parameter. In other words, for any theory in which you just introduce such supplementary parameter, then you can write some general mathematical relation. And the most, uh, and, and, and with this mathematical relation, we are going to find a very interesting result, which is called Bell's inequality. But before going to this Bell's inequality, I want to make clear how it works. There is a very simple to think of model, which is a particular one, but a good one. I already refer to it. Let us suppose that when they leave, the two photons vibrate along a certain direction, okay? Let us admit that it has a meaning. When the first photon arrives on the polarizer here, so the supplementary property lambda tells me if it vibrates along this angle or this angle or this angle. So lambda is nothing else than an angle between 0 and 360 degrees, between 0 and 2 pi. Okay. Now, when the photon with a certain direction of vibration arrives on this polarizer, I would like to have a function which can take only value of plus 1, minus 1, telling me where the photon will go out. Will, will it go into the output channel plus one or the output channel minus one? And for that, I have to invent a function, and it's not so difficult. If the photon vibrates along the direction of the analyzer, it has to give plus one. If it is perpendicular, it has to give minus one. And in between, well, we put the frontier at 45 degrees. If it is close to the vertical axis, it will be plus one. If it is more than 45 degrees, it will be minus one. This horrible formula here tells you nothing else than what I tell you. For more than 45 degrees, it's minus one. For less than 45 degrees, it's plus one. With this very simple model, and a model in which we admit that the photon can take all possible orientation, you make the ensemble average, and the result of the calculation is a correlation which is described by the red curve here. And this red curve, result of this simple model, is very good. Because look, it reproduces exactly the quantum mechanical prediction for zero degree, the total correlation, they all go like that or all go like that. And 90 degrees, it's also the total correlation. Minus one means that when one go up, the other one will in the minus channel. And in between, it's not so bad. So you begin to think, if such a simple model gives a pretty good result like that, it's probable that by going to more sophisticated function, Bessel function, you know, there are plenty of mathematics available, and probably that with more sophisticated mathematics, I can build a model agreeing with quantum mechanical prediction at all orientation. Is it possible? And Bell's theorem gives the answer, no. You cannot find any model to reproduce all the prediction of quantum mechanics. You can reproduce a prediction here or there, but not for all angles. The way it works, so no local hidden variable theory, that is to say theory with such supplementary parameter, can reproduce quantum mechanical predictions, which means that the fact that you reproduce here and there, but not here, is a general fact, is not only the fact that we are the two simple model. The way it works in an set, the, the big discovery of John Bell, is the following. If you accept that you describe the correlation with such supplementary parameter, then you can demonstrate that a certain quantity is restricted. And I give it, it, I give it here in the form that it was discovered by Clauser, Horn, Shimoni, and Holt, and we are 
proud that uh, Klaus and Horn are in the room here. They are the two people among four who discovered this wonderful inequality, which is very convenient for experiments. And what you have here is something which is simple. You have two orientations for the first polarizer, A and A prime. Two orientations for the second polarizer, B and B prime. So you will do four measurements, A, B, A, B prime, A prime, B, A prime, B prime. And what was found is that this quantity cannot be bigger than two, cannot be less than minus two, if this are, can be understood with supplementary parameters. On the other hand, the quantum mechanical prediction for an EPR situation, for the highly entangled situation, predicts that this has a value cosine of two times the angle, and people who know a little bit of trigonometry will appreciate what happens here. This angle is pi over eight, pi over eight, pi over eight. Let us consider this specific set, this particular set of orientation. AB is pi over eight, two times A over, pi over eight is pi over four, cosine of pi over four is one over root two. Now, if I take this term, it's also one over root two, this is one also one over root two. Now, A, B prime, I double, and the cosine is negative. So here, I have minus, minus, one over root two, it's again one over root two. So I have four times one over root two, which gives two root two, which is definitely bigger than two. Which means that for this set of orientation, the prediction of quantum mechanics does not obey this Clauser, Horn, Shimoni, Hort, Bell inequality which means that there is no supplementary parameter theory, no theory with a lambda which can reproduce the prediction of quantum mechanics here. Which means that now it's no longer a matter of interpretation only. It's a conflict. The possibility to complete quantum mechanics according to Einstein's idea is no longer a matter of our taste. It has turned into an experimental question if we do an experiment in this situation, are we going to find more than two, or are we going to find a result which does not exceed two? That was the question. Before going into, you did not tell me how, how long I can talk. Two hours, three hours, <laughs> one hour, okay. good, thank you. Ah, one hour, is fine. Before going to the experiment, look. You have here a beautiful theorem due to John Bell, which establishes a conflict with quantum mechanics. When you have a conflict with quantum mechanics, with, which is such a successful theory, better to check what is the formalism leading to the conflict. And there have been a lot of discussion, but at the end of the day, people agree that in order to have a conflict, you need to have a few ingredients. First, you must admit that each particle, each photon here, carries along with it some properties that we call lambda, and this property, lambda, will determine the outcome of the measurement here. And the other one carries lambda, which will determine the result of the, uh, of the measurement here. This follow Einstein view that we call local realist worldview, what does it mean? Einstein insisted that the particle traveling here must have a set of property, he calls it physical reality, and this property determines the result of measurement here. And these properties are attributed to that particle traveling here, this is why he calls it local. Uh, uh, realistic point of view. Realist makes reference to what he calls physical reality, which determines the outcome. There is also, in order to demonstrate Bell's inequality and to find Bell's inequality, what Bell uh, called a locality condition, which is the following. The result of the measurement here is allowed to depend on the orientation of the polarizer, on the value of lambda, but certainly not on the setting of the other polarizer, which is there. And reciprocally, the result here is not allowed to depend on the setting of this polarizer. And similarly, the way in which the pair are prepared should not depend on the orientation of the polarizer that will make the measurement later. 
With this hypothesis, you demonstrate Bell's inequality. But this hypothesis, you can notice that, in fact, you can enforce it by an experiment. Because let's suppose, and this was suggested by Bell in his paper following discussion by Baum and Aronoff in previous uh, paper, let's suppose that while the photon is traveling from the source to here, you suddenly change at the last moment the orientation of this polarizer. Then, because nothing propagates faster than light, it becomes clear that the result of the measurement here cannot depend on the orientation of this one. Similarly, if you change both orientation, the result here cannot depend on the orientation of the other one. And obviously, because the change happens after the two photons leave the source, the way in which you prepare the photon in the source cannot depend on the orientation of this one and of that one. So the conflict between quantum mechanics and Einstein's worldview now no longer depends on Bell's locality assumption because Bell's locality assumption is just enforced by Einstein's relativity. So you see, we have invoked Einstein's relativity several times. So the conflict which is revealed by the violation of quantum mechanics or by the conflict between the, the violation of Bell's inequality, the conflicts between uh, the local hidden variable theory and quantum mechanics is really a conflict with Einstein's worldview because we have invoked uh, local realism based on relativity several times. Okay, this being done, we know now that an experimental test is possible. And when the paper of Bell was written, it was a big surprise. There was, so John Clauser told us that today. He, he was looking into data, and there was no data, no experiment available to test Bell's inequality. So it was necessary to develop specific uh, uh, situation and to develop experimental scheme where the test is possible and it was the, the virtue of this famous paper, Clauser Horn Shimoni Hall proposal of 1969 to propose uh, a real realistic situation in which it would be possible to test Bell's inequality. So to make a long story short, I think it's fair to say that there were three periods. They were the pioneers in the decade 1970. 1972 was the first experiment by Clauser and Friedman in Berkeley. At the same time, there was an experiment in Harvard. And then these experiments were quite uh, interesting because Clauser and Friedman found a violation of Bell's inequality in quantum mechanics while the competing, I should say, experiment in Harvard, found agreement with Bell's inequality and result different from quantum mechanics. Quite rapidly, there was a clear trend in favor of quantum mechanics. Clauser repeated the experiment of Harvard. Fry in Texas using for the first time a laser, that is to say making uh, the data a little more easy to interpret. Found there was a clear trend in, quantum, in favor of quantum mechanics. Anyway, these experiments were awfully difficult, and in addition, it was not yet too close to the ideal Gedanken experiment, to the ideal experiment I have described and on which theorists like to argue. And this is why, in 1975, I started a, a, a new type of experiment, the goal being to go for schemes closer and closer to the ideal experiment. And then I will rapidly describe the modern version of these experiments leading to quantum information. So just a few view graphs about this series of experiments here. The, the main improvement was the fact that by using two lasers, we were able to produce source of pairs of entangled photons of unprecedented uh, efficiency. And to make a long story short, we could observe, actually in the lab, 100 coincidences per second. Maybe people who are not uh, scientists or not experimentalists are not impressed, but you should be impressed. Because it means that if you accumulate data for only 100 seconds, which is less than two minutes, then you have 10,000 data. And then the statistical fluctuation on that, which is the root of the number, is only 100. And 100 divided by 10,000 means 
1% accuracy. So in only a few minutes, in two minutes, you have 1% accuracy. This allows you to multiply the measurement, make plenty of tests, etc. It makes like really uh, easy. And of course, the source was complicated. It takes us many years to develop the source. There are many laser, atomic beam, etc. But at the end, it works. So the first thing we did was to do an experiment similar to the one of, uh, uh, of John Klaus and uh, other people. But there is something we could do was to pull the polarizer far enough for the experiment and to check that entanglement survives even when you go at some distance from the source. It was six meters at that time because my room was 13 meters, so I could go six meters on one side, six meters on the other side. You will see that they were much better more recently, but it was a thing. So this experiment was like the previous one with a better source and a small bonus, which is checking that entanglement survives large distance. Then, I will not go into details, but we did two experiments really closer to the scheme. First, this one on which we, for the first time, could use on such an experiment polarizer with really two channels. The channel giving plus one and the channel giving minus one. In previous experiment, we had only access to the plus one channel and not to the minus one. And this allowed us to make the test already closer to the ideal experiment. And we found a violation of Bell's inequality by more than 40 standard deviation, which is a lot. Okay. Then the third experiment, which is really the one for which I had started this program, I wanted to be able to turn the polarizer while the photons are in flight. But let us put numbers. To travel over six meters, it takes 20 nanoseconds for light. A nanosecond is one billionth of a second. It's very fast, OK? You are not going to turn a big piece of equipment in a few nanoseconds. So the trick we used was the following. We build switches here, a switch which can either let light go like that or redirect it towards another polarizer. Here, I have a polarizer in orientation A. Here, another polarizer in orientation A prime. And the switch goes at the nanosecond scale, which means that either I analyze along A or I analyze along A prime, and it amounts to turning the polarizer very rapidly. The experiment was more difficult, but we got a uh, reasonable violation of Bell's inequality by six standard deviation. For people who are not scientists, you should remember that when they found the Higgs boson with five standard deviation, they thought they could publish it, okay? And they got a Nobel Prize for that, for five standard deviation. So this is reasonable. So we have here the fact that Einstein's worldviews are untenable, entanglement is really as extraordinary as resulting from the discussion between Bohr and Einstein. The third generation of experiment. I want to cite two beautiful experiments that were done in the late 90s, 1990s. There was a big improvement the fact that they could build, and again, we have here in this room many heroes of all this story, they built a new source of entangled photon, which was not only producing a high rate of entangled photon, but compared to my source, which did produce a high rate of entangled photon, it has a big advantage that now the two entangled photons were produced in a well-defined direction. In my source, there were many pairs, but the photons were going in all directions in space. So you take a big lens and you try to catch as many as you can, but you miss plenty of them. Now in, with this new source, the photon go either in this direction or in that direction, and the direction is so well defined that you can inject the photon into an optical fiber. And once the photons are in an optical fiber, you can then put the measuring apparatus at the end of the optical fiber. So I like to cite two experiments. The experiment of Nicolas Gisin, in Geneva, who could convince Swiss Telecom to lend him the optical fibers of the commercial network 
of Swiss Telecom at night. It seems that at night, Swiss people are quiet, they sleep, they do not need, they do not need their uh, optical fiber networks, at least not full, the, the full network. And so he could make measurements of and check that entanglement survives many kilometers. The other experiment I want to cite is an experiment which was done here in Austria, in Innsbruck, at the time where the president of the academy was in Innsbruck and not in Vienna. It's a beautiful experiment done by Greg Weiss. Was he a PhD student at that, at that time? Greg Weiss, a PhD student, and then Anton Zalinger. And again, they inject the photon in optical fiber, and they could do an experiment along similar lines to the experiment I did, but it was a big improvement. In my case, I was switching back and forth rapidly, but could not, uh, it was almost periodic, okay, like that. Here, the length of the fiber was long enough that they could have a random number generate here to choose randomly the orientation of the polarizer after the photon leaves the source. So it was the ultimate switching experiment. They found a full agreement to quantum mechanics, and it was a really wonderful experiment. Okay, there have, we have had many other experiments, okay, and there is a long history of loopholes and closing loopholes, etc. In particular, recently, there was a loophole related to the fact that detectors of photons are not so good, so people could argue, okay, but you lose photons, so maybe you are not sure of the statistic you are doing. Recently, using really fantastic detectors, which have a perfect efficiency. There have been two experiments, uh, one in Urbana Champaign, uh, one in, uh, in, uh, in Vienna here, closing this famous sensitive loophole. So I think, although some people could argue against that, but most of the people would agree that really Bell's inequality have been violated in all reasonable way, and so Einstein's local realism, Einstein's worldview about how the work is working is untenable. And so this is a big uh, conceptual question. What should we conclude from that? Well, believe me or not, Einstein told us what we should conclude. And of course you are going to tell me, come on, Einstein did not believe in what he was claiming? Yes, he was believing what he was claiming. But he told us, if I not, was not right, this is what would happen. Reasoning ad absurdo. Okay? And so he wrote, if I was not right, he had considered the fact that if he was not right, then you would have either to drop, these are the words of Einstein, okay? either drop the need of the independence of the physical reality present in different parts of space, or accept that the measurement of one side changing instantaneously, this is a word of Einstein, the real situation on the other side. In other words, what Einstein tells us, if I was not right, Einstein speaking, but we know now that he is not right, you would have to accept that doing something here affects instantaneously something there. And this is very shocking, of course, from the point of view of relativity. This is called quantum non-locality. Some people like to call it quantum holism, which is also a nice concept, which means the following thing. In contrast to the idea of Einstein that when I have one particle here, this particle has well-defined properties, and the other one which is here has well-defined properties, quantum holism tells you you are not allowed to consider separately the two particles you have to consider the ensemble of the two particles as a single system, and the single system has properties which are much more than the union of the properties of the first particle and the properties of the second one. This quantum holism, it's more or less equivalent. Okay. Well, note that if you want to ask me a question later, even if you accept, if, uh, if some of us, and I belong to this category, accept the idea of quantum locality, we cannot use it anyway to transmit a utilizable signal faster than light. If you ask me the question, I will be glad to answer the question. But let us go ahead 
now we have to accept this violation of Bell's inequality, what do we do with that? Well, as I told you, smart physicists, and one of the first was probably the first were Richard Feynman in 1982, say, OK, since entanglement is so fantastic, since quantum mechanics is so fantastic, let us use these new properties of quantum mechanics to develop a new way to process and transmit information. So it was the ideas of quantum computing, quantum cryptography, Bennett and Brassard, Gilles Brassard is here, again, many of the names are here, uh, Eckert, uh, quantum teleportation, I will not comment about that, but there was also beautiful experiments done here, quantum simulation, a lot of quantum simulation is done in this Austrian physics, etc. Entanglement is at the root of most of the schemes for quantum information, and I'm going to give you one or two ideas about how it works. Let us start with quantum cryptography because it can be explained very easily as a direct consequence of what I have explained in the Arthur Eckert scheme, which stems directly for what we have. What is the problem? Alice and Bob are friends. They want to exchange messages, but there is an awful spy. We call it Eve because in English, the spy is called an eavesdropper. Okay, and so these white people name the spy Eve, and you know that he's really awful. He has a mustache and everything, so it's, a, it's an awful, it's a bad guy. Okay, and it has been demonstrated by Shannon, who is a fantastic uh, uh, researcher, who would really establish the theory of information, that there is an absolutely secure way of encoding and decoding information that are the following thing. Alice and Bob have two identical copies of a random series of one and zero, or one or minus one if you want, okay? One, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one. They have the same copy here and there. Alice is going to use the key to encode the message, and Bob is going to use the similar key, the copy of that key, to decode the message. And it can be shown with mathematical certainty that provided that the message is not longer than the key, then there is no way to decode it. You know, you have read novels about spying, etc. If you use the same key several times, or if you want to encode a message longer than the key, then you recognize regularity in the encoding, and then at the end you can decipher. But if the message is not longer than the key, then you are safe. So now the problem boils down to the following. Alice and Bob have used the key, and now they have no more key. Can we distribute two identical copies of a random series of one and zero to each of them without the spy being able to get a third copy of it? Because if he gets a third copy of it, then he can decipher the message when they use a key. And uh, distributing keys like that is the goal and is the achievement of quantum information. And in the Eckert scheme, you use exactly the kind of properties I have been describing here. You remember my two entangled photons. If Alice and Bob select the same direction for the polarizer, until the last moment, you don't know if it will be plus one or minus one, but if it is plus one here, it will be plus one here, and if it is minus one here, it will be minus one there. So you will get a series of random one and zero, but the two sides will be exactly identical. So they have the two copies. So now what about the spy? Could he intercept the photon? Well, first remember that until the last moment, until the moment when you do the measurement, there is no polarization for the photon. The fact that it is plus one or minus one has not yet been decided. If it had been decided before, we would not have observed the violation of Bell's inequality. So there is really nothing to spy. Let us admit anyway that the spy has a good technology and is smart, so he can make a measurement here, so he puts a polarizer in a certain orientation and finds a result. And then he sends a photon with the same result as the one he found. Now what happens? 
Now there is a real polarization for the photon, which is an objective property, which means that if Alice and Bob make a test of Bell's inequality, they are not going to find a violation of Bell's inequality. So the idea of this scheme is the following. Alice and Bob make observations, and they change the orientation of the polarizer, and from time to time they make a test. That is to say, they exchange by a public radio, they say, ah, my angle was 22.5 degrees on measurement number 1270, and they, so they exchange publicly, and on this restricted set, they make a test of Bell's inequality. If they do violate Bell's inequality, they are sure there is no spy on the line. And then they keep the rest of the data to have the key for communicating. This is really something which is now used, and you can even buy some devices for doing quantum cryptography. It does not follow exactly that scheme. Most of the time it follows more the scheme of Bennett and Brassa, but the idea is the following. The idea is that the safety, the security, relies on the basic laws of quantum mechanics. That's the point. Quantum computing. A rapid idea of what is quantum computing, which was also developed. In contrast to quantum cryptography, quantum computing does not work yet. We don't know if it will ever work, but at least it does not work yet. Maybe it will work one day. The idea is the following. It's massive parallelism. You remember, if I have two quantum bits entangled, I can have plus plus or plus minus or minus plus or minus minus, which means that this entangled state lives in a space of dimension four. If I have three entangled qubits, I can have plus 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 minus, etc. eight possible combinations. The size of the Hilbert space where I describe it is eight. If now I have 10 entangled qubits, the size is 2 to the 10, which is about 1,000. If I have 20 entangled qubits, the size is 1 million. 30 entangled qubits, 1 billion. Let's suppose that I have 30 entangled qubits, which we do not have, but let's suppose that we have. Then if you do an elementary operation on your 30 entangled qubits, you simultaneously process 1 billion data. So the idea of quantum computing is massive parallelism. We don't know if it will work, but it is a beautiful idea, and many people in the world work on it. And in particular, uh, the world record of entangled ions is by a group of Rainer Blatt, which belongs to the ECOKI, who is in uh, Innsbruck, and it's 14 or 15 entangled qubits. The problem is that according to the best theories, we need 100,000, and the record is only 15. So it needs really a lot of research and of breakthrough in order to be able to make a quantum computer working. If it was working, it would be a kind of Schrodinger cat. This is why it is such an exciting research. Okay. There is also another way of doing quantum computation, which is quantum simulation. But okay, let us skip it and go to the conclusion. I claim that we are probably living a new quantum era, a new quantum revolution. And uh, you have probably understood from my talk that I consider, and many of us consider, that realizing the power of entanglement is one of the ingredients of the new quantum revolution. There is a second ingredient that should not be underestimated. It's the fact that nowadays we know how to produce, observe, control, make measurement on single quantum object. It may seem to you obvious, but the most famous physicist 50 years ago thought that it was not possible. They thought that we could only consider large ensemble. In a laser beams, you have millions of, of, of photons. In a piece of conducting matter, you have billions of electrons, etc. And so they were not surprised that quantum mechanics is about statistical properties. They say, if I have a large ensemble of particles, then it's normal to have a theory which gives you only statistical properties. But now we have learned in the last 40 years, we have learned to trap a single electron, keep it, observe it, move and observe single atom, produce single photons, etc., etc. 
manipulate single ions, etc., etc. So the new quantum revolution is really based on the ability to manipulate and control individual quantum objects and also to uh, entangle them and use entanglement. So you remember I told you already that the first quantum revolution gave us the information society with the lasers, the transistor, etc. Will quantum computing and quantum communication system lead to the quantum information society? Well, if we can think of a roadmap, probably it goes from proof of principle with well-defined emittery microscopic objects like photon atom ions to artifacts. It's amazing that nowadays some of our colleagues, who again are here in this room, can build objects of microelectronics, and these objects are real quantum behavior. They can be entangled, etc., just like our photons, our ions, our atoms, etc. This is absolutely fascinating that solid state divides built by man can show these elementary quantum properties. And if I have to make a bet, it's probably this kind of devices that will lead us to more and more quantum information. With this, it's a fascinating issue. We live exciting times. And I would like again tell that we stand on shoulder of giants. And it's especially appropriate to mention John Bell, who belongs to a beautiful series, Einstein, Schrodinger, Bohr, Feynman. And I think that really John Bell has his place here in this gallery. Thank you very much. You already indicated on, on your willingness to answer a few questions. Including maybe, a suggested question. Yeah, <laughs> but, but, uh, maybe somebody uh, uh, remembers them. So anyway, the floor is open for, for a few uh, questions. Who wants to be the first one? Well, then Helmut Rauch, who is also a member of this academy, please. <laughs> Thank you. No, no. But anyway, uh, let's say uh, some critical comments um, should be also made, and that makes it interesting, yes? Anyway, uh, for Eve, uh, I guess in all these setups, there are also parasitic beams sure. due to reflection or losses from the fiber or so on. Sure. So uh, the spy could get access to these parasitic uh, beams yes. and get information what has been communicated without yes. uh, really breaking down uh, the communication. So it's a very, it's a very good equation about this uh, quantum cryptography uh, system. And so, of course, I present it in a very naive and simple way, but uh, it's so important you realize that uh, recently there was a certain Mr. Snowden who taught us some things. So it's really important, this question of quantum cryptography, okay? And so this is a real, fully developed field, okay? And of course, it's much more sophisticated than what I indicate here. So indeed, when you have a scheme like this one here, there are losses here, and people when they make the theory of the security, they assume that when you have a loss, this loss could be used by a spy. So which means that they when make the theory of the security of, this, uh, of these schemes, they take into account this and they say, we assume that any loss could be used by a spy. And so they put limits and they say, in order to be sure that it is safe, this is the constraint that we have to put, and so then the people work hard to have the constraint and to put the loss below a certain threshold, etc. So it's really a full scientific and technological endeavor and development, and when they tell you that it is safe, it's safe because they take into account all these inefficiency, and they take them in 
to account in the more pessimistic way in saying, well, maybe it's absorption, and in case of absorption, then, of course, nobody can use it. But they say, okay, let us assume that all the losses could be used by the spy. What is the constraint? So it's really impressive what they achieve. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, questions? Who there is another is the naive. There is another naive our, physicist around there. Our chairman, the dean, chairman the dean of, of the, the <laughs> physics department. Yes, <laughs> the uh, chair I, of the physics department. I have department. a question here. Huh? I have a question here. Ah, a real, a oh, real we'll naive. There first, yeah. <laughs> um, right. Professor Ashby, uh, we thank you for your brilliant lecture. It's very nice, and you have shown us how. Uh, the core feature of quantum mechanics, the entanglement, is being put to practical use. My question is, despite this increasing success in using quantum theory, there are many serious researchers in quantum mechanics who remain dissatisfied in one way or other with the theory. We heard um, Professor Mermin talk about moving towards putting the experience and the experience are inside physics. And there are other people, and uh, there is also, a, in, in, in other words, there are a group of active researchers who feel that somehow there is a deeper science behind present quantum mechanics that needs to be understood. So what do you think, what is your opinion on that, and how do you think that that could influence physics? Will it influence physics in an even more amazing way, or it would be just a failure, a dead end, a cul-de-sac. Okay, well, to, to answer to your question, first, uh, a remark. I don't think that uh, uh, Professor Maimin tells us that there is anything wrong with that. It's a matter of interpretation. We don't agree on the interpretation, but we are in the same situation as uh, before Bell's inequality, Einstein and Bohr. We share the same way of doing the mathematics of uh, quantum mechanics. We may not share the same interpretation. Now, what you are telling us is something else. You tell us that some people are so dissatisfied with the general interpretation of quantum mechanics that they hope that there will be something beyond quantum mechanics. I'm totally sympathetic to that. Uh, I would be very happy that there is something beyond quantum mechanics, but I have no idea of where it could happen. And one thing that we learned from this is that it would have been a very nice way. I mean, Einstein was not stupid. The suggestion of Einstein, which was taken by John Bell, to say, OK, let us complete it in order to have a nice interpretation of this correlation. If it had worked, would have been interesting. Of course, there are plenty of problems associated to it, but anyway, would have been interesting. But what we see is that such simple efforts to go beyond quantum mechanics have not worked. So we have to search in different directions, and I certainly I am not a person who say that it is a final theory and that nothing will come after it. I would be very happy to see new developments one thing I am deeply convinced is that a new theory, if it exists, will not contradict quantum mechanics. It will incorporate quantum mechanics into a bigger framework, just like Einstein's relativity incorporated Newtonian mechanics into it. But I have not the, thing, the, the first idea of where it could happen, so... People who want to work on that are welcome, but I don't know where, where, where they will find it. Marcus? Um, does it work? Okay. Yes. Um, since I know so little about uh, entanglement, a fundamental question related to entanglement and space-time. So if you drive it really to the extremes, and it's all about locality and non-locality, if you drive it to extremes, would entanglement survive three different cases? One, during inflation after the Big Bang, Second, when you throw one of the partners into a black hole, can you probe a black hole, question mark? Um, and third, what happens if there's really quantized space-time, if there are fluctuations of space-time, what happens to entanglement? And so far, for 144 kilometers, everything seems to be fine, so Anton Seiling has proven that. But uh, what about a mil million kilometers, a billion kilometers, and... And black Unfortunately, holes. this is not my field of physics. I don't know if there is anybody in the room who can answer this question, but I don't know enough about inflation. I don't know enough 
about uh, uh, all, all these uh, big uh, cosmological theory and things like that. I don't know. But maybe one comment I can make is that we know that if we accept non-locality, then we have heard several talks, and we know that we have to accept the idea of an instantaneous influence going some, from here to there. It looks shocking to people who have been trained uh, with relativity, but on the other hand, as we heard from the talk of Nicolas Gizeng, which was given by Oscar Rani, but I know that these are the ideas of Nicolas Gizeng, after all, there is a preferred frame of reference in the universe, as we know it, that's the frame of reference where the cosmological background is isotropic. And if you accept that there is a preferred frame of reference, there is nothing shocking in having something going instantaneously in that frame of reference. But this does not answer your question, I know, but I cannot answer your question. You have to speak to big cosmologists, okay? People who know these uh, kind of theories. Why can we not communicate faster than light? This is interesting. Very interesting question. Thank you very much. <laughs> no faster than light signaling with EPR pairs. Even if we have non-locality, if we accept the idea of non-locality, that is to say the fact that when the measurement happens here, then immediately the state of the other photon is changed, we cannot use this non-locality to transmit a signal which can be used by the partner. How does it work? Alice changed the orientation of the polarizer here, so from A to A prime, for instance, can Bob instantaneously observe a change in his measurement? Then it would be transmitting a real signal faster than light. The answer is no for an obvious reason. You remember that the signal probabilities to observe plus one or minus one was always 50%. So Bob observing here only his results still see 50% chances and he cannot find any conclusion. In order to draw a conclusion, he has to know what is the correlation between the result here and the result there. And so, in order to know this correlation, he has to compare his results to the results that you have here. But how can he compare? He needs to have somebody here looking at the result, taking a normal telephone, sending the result through a normal line, and this line cannot go, it's a classical line, cannot go faster than light. So you may be disappointed, but on the other hand, you should know that, for instance, in the famous teleportation scheme that was performed here in particular, Teleportation scheme is a wonderful scheme in which a quantum state can be transported from here to there. But surprisingly, you need a scheme of that kind. That is to say, a scheme in which on one hand you have a quantum channel where something apparently is transmitted faster than light, but that's not the end of the story. To complete the story, you must also make a measurement here, look at the result of the measurement, send the result of the measurement through a classical channel, and then finally make a final transformation here, and then, and only then, the teleportation is achieved. So these ideas that you have two channels, a quantum channel instantaneous, plus a classical channel that does not violate uh, uh, relativity, is the explanation that you cannot transmit light faster than light. At this point, if you are disappointed and say, OK, was it really worth coming and attending such a conference when we have so wonderful soccer game on the TV or things like that, I would like to take a point of view on the experiment, which is exactly the point of view that was taken by Greg Weiss and Anton Zeilinger in their experiment. The experiment was done in the following way. You have the source. Here you have Alice switching from A to A prime, etc., and she's making a record of everything happening here. At this time, I switch my polarizer and I observe this. The other guy does the same thing. At that time, I switch my polarizer, this is the result. 
when everything is finished, they take the two sets of data, bring them together, and observe. And they have to acknowledge that at the very moment when Alice changed the orientation, then the correlation did change. So it could not be used to transmit instantaneous useful signal, but when you look at it from the point of view of the archaeologist, then you have to acknowledge that there was something like a non-locality, like an instantaneous thing happening. So it's still interesting, even with these restrictions that we cannot use it for practical purpose. Thank you. It was worth the explanation, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. You have no choice, sure. you have to say yes. I mean, it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's one last question and then we should uh, come to an end. Here's the last question, please. Very short question. Can you use this instantaneously uh, to synchronize clocks? Yes. Maybe. In principle, yes. Maybe, because in clocks, you have something which is repetitive. But on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, because it's repetitive, it's not such an issue to use an instantaneous uh, thing. So let's put it in a more general framework. There is no doubt that metrology can be improved by all these quantum technologies. The quantum technologies, there are several examples already uh, in application where we find by using these quantum ideas, we can achieve an accuracy which is better that we can achieve with classical technologies. So, from this point of view, using these ideas of entanglement and of quantum properties, yes, we can synchronize clock with a better accuracy that we could do according to classical notions. Okay, so, well, I think, thank you, we, we might come to an end. Uh, just uh, one small remark. I should remark that in this hall where you have given your talk, some, some uh, uh, interesting music was performed more than 200 years ago, because this was, uh, this was uh, one of the few and probably the largest public room around the time of Beethoven or Haydn or Mozart here in Vienna. So many famous works were performed here for the first time. I'm by, impressed. By these people. I'm impressed. And so here's a little recording of such music, not from the time of Beethoven, Mozart, but what we do, we reenact these kind of things. And so this is for you to remember the place. Thank you very Here's much. I appreciate information about the place where you have been. Thank you very much, Anton. And uh, uh, with uh, our invitation to come downstairs and share a glass of wine with all of us. I would like to thank you for coming and I would like to thank the speaker again for his talk. Thank you.